we are experiencing something, you and me, something that no human in history has ever experienced before. There is in my pocket, and I imagine yours too, this small device, I can fit it in the palm of my hand, and, and it will deliver to me throughout the day an endless stream of crises and disasters. Multiple times throughout the day, every day, we are called to attend to some new emergency. This puts us in, in a near constant state of alarm. We are worried all the time. In fact, you can track Google searches over time. And, and if you look for the phrase worried all the time, you can see that it's trending upward worldwide over the past five years. Here's the problem. As human beings, we, we naturally feel a, a certain sympathy for, for other people, for human suffering. And many of us feel a, an ethical obligation to at least be informed about injustice or humanitarian crises. At the same time, it's, it's easy to become overwhelmed by the sheer size and complexity of the world's problems. So on the one hand, we feel the need to, to stay connected, to, to keep on top of all, all the things that are happening in the world. And on the other hand, our own sanity, our own well-being seems to require that we turn away from, from the world's suffering. Is there a limit to how much suffering the, the human brain can, can process or the human heart can stand? And is choosing to look away, does that make you a bad person? One way of approaching this question is to ask, what do you owe to other human beings? How much of your, your attention, your, your energy, your money do you owe to people living on the other side of the country or the other side of the ocean? Now, when we think of owing things to other people, we often think in terms of community. If we belong to the same community, if we live in the same apartment building or in the same neighborhood, we usually think that we have shared obligations to each other. But is there some limit? Are there limits to how big a community can be and therefore limits to, to how many problems, how many people you have the capacity to help? Now, interestingly, ancient philosophy actually has something to teach us about this. The Greek philosopher Aristotle thought a lot about politics and also about human limitations. For Aristotle, it was important for us to recognize that as human beings, we have limits. There are limits to how much you can do, how much you can work, how long you can live. There, there's just limits to what's possible for a human being. He also famously put a limit on the appropriate size of a human community. And he wrote that, well, obviously a city can't be 10 people, it's gotta be more than 10, but it also can't be more than, and this, this might strike us as a little funny, he said the ceiling for a city is 100,000 people. Now Aristotle knew it was possible for cities to be bigger, but he just didn't think it was good for cities to be bigger. He says in his politics, for example, Now most persons suppose that it is appropriate for the happy city to be great. To the extent that this is true, they are ignorant of what sort of city is great and what sort small. They judge a city to be great on the basis of the magnitude of the number of inhabitants, but one should not look to their number, but to their capacity. To be a great city and a populous city is not the same thing. Now Aristotle's argument about how big a city should be is pretty interesting because what he's really talking about is the best possible human life. Like how big does a community need to be in order to provide people with the best possible human life. And he says that, that the real measure is, you know, do you have enough people in the community to fulfill all the necessary roles needed by people in their lives? You need enough farmers to feed people, you need enough doctors to treat sick people, you need enough carpenters and architects to build the houses so that there's enough homes for people, you need enough schools for all the children, you need enough teachers to teach all those children. And we know from our own lives that, that you can have too much of those things or, or too few. You can have doctor shortages or teacher shortages or due to population decline, you might have to close down a fire department or a school or a hospital. But Aristotle makes another point about the size of cities, the, the limit for how big cities can be that has some bearing on our conversation about, about all the stress and worry that comes from social media. No. Yeah, well, all right, we'll just try this. Hi, I'm editing. I didn't do a good job explaining this the first time, so I'm gonna try again. Here's the key thing. Aristotle says that as, as communities become bigger and bigger, our political decision-making becomes impaired. A good example is something like an election, like when you're voting for somebody. Aristotle says when a community is the appropriate size, it's possible for you to know all of the candidates. So you can make an informed decision 
about who it is you're voting for. You actually know the people or you know someone who knows the person who, who might hold a political office. As communities become bigger and bigger, this becomes harder to do. And this is sort of generally a problem with all of the political decisions you might be called upon to make. I had one good line in my first run through of this argument. Here it is. When your state becomes too big, it becomes difficult to make informed decisions about politics. What he says, that's, that's the key point. So here's the key question. As communities become bigger and bigger, does it become more and more difficult for us to comprehend what's going on and does it even become impossible for us to participate meaningfully in debates and conversations? Like, how are we supposed to know what to do? Speaking of which, while I have you here, one thing you could do is, is subscribe to the channel. I'm just here trying to understand how the world works. And maybe I can help you understand that a bit better too. So hit, hit that subscribe button. For now, we'll just keep trying to understand this problem. How do we understand ourselves as part of a community, as the, the community of human beings just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Now, it does actually seem to be possible for us to identify with, to sympathize with, to understand people, large numbers of people across vast expanses of territory. This is something that Benedict Anderson wrote about in his very famous work, Imagined Communities. Anderson is really interested in the idea of the nation. And, and his opening point is that the nation proves to be a really tricky problem, specifically for Marxist theorists to overcome. That's because Marxism essentially represents this, this philosophical, political, economic attempt to unify the working class around the world, across borders, regardless of national or ethnic backgrounds. But even though working class people in, in Bangladesh or, or Canada or Croatia might have a lot in common with each other, it does seem that it's more common for people from a place, from a country, to identify with, with their fellow citizens more so than they identify with, with someone of the same class from a different country or culture. This is really a question about our imaginative and sympathetic limitations. A nation, Anderson argues, is an imagined community. Yes, nations have, have borders and governments, they have legal systems, but, but really, the act of, of thinking of myself as, as belonging to the same community as someone who lives thousands of miles or kilometers away, that's an act of imagination. A nation is imagined as a community because regardless of the actual inequality and exploitation that may prevail in each, the nation is always conceived as a deep horizontal comradeship. Anderson argues that the invention of print played a really important part in, in allowing human beings to conceptualize themselves, to imagine themselves as belonging to the same nation as, as people who live very far away. Print can travel. It can be distributed in the, in the form of books and pamphlets and magazines and newspapers across a large geographical space. And so print allows a group of people, even if they're dispersed across a, a large area, to partake in a, in a shared culture. And importantly, I think a shared point of view. Imagine the way a, a newspaper written in a particular language, expressing a, a particular view about what's important or what's not important. Imagine how that newspaper can, can unite a, a group of people, invite them to, to share a particular point of view or a particular set of priorities. I may have never met people who live on the other side of the country, but because of media, it's likely that we have a shared understanding of, of the world and the way it works. And this allows me then to imagine myself as, as being in community with them in a way that maybe wasn't possible before. So one of the important insights here, something that Anderson understands that I think Aristotle maybe could not have, is the way that communication technologies change the way we understand ourselves and the way we understand communities. Now, Imagine Communities was first published in the 1980s. That's about a decade before dial-up internet was widely available and about 20 years before the emergence of social media. So if the invention of print helped to move us from, from the city-state to the, the idea of the nation, what does the invention of the internet and social media do to our understanding of, of human community? this internet thing? Do you, do you know anything about that? Sure. It spans the globe like a super highway. 
It is called Internet. At the school gate on the way home, evidence of the text messaging craze is everywhere. As new terrestrial and submarine cables link the continent to the rest of the world. We decided to put high-speed free public Wi-Fi in India's railway stations. We're in 400 stations today. So there's a way in which the, the digital revolution, the Internet revolution, has made it possible for us to expand our idea of community again and, and, and think of ourselves as being in community with everyone on Earth. Our new electronic media or our new gadgets. You push a button and the world's yours. The world is now a global village. A global village. But if we think back to Aristotle's point about not knowing other people and, and therefore not being able to make informed political decisions, has the internet, has social media, finally made the community so big that that we can no longer wrap our brains around it. Maybe digital technology has put us into community with the whole world. But if that's the case, has the community become so big that our, our brains can no longer process it? And is this a new form of the problem Aristotle was talking about when he said, when a city gets too big, and you don't know your neighbors, you, you can no longer make informed political decisions. How can you hope to have informed opinions and act ethically when you are constantly being fed a stream of, of new and different, complicated political, economic, environmental problems? And what does it mean if we can't? Have you ever read Martin Luther King's letter from Birmingham jail? It's one of the most important texts of the of the American Civil Rights Movement. It's probably one of the greatest essays in the in the history of American political philosophy. King wrote the letter from Birmingham jail in April of 1963. King was in Birmingham as part of the Birmingham campaign, a, a series of protests against segregation in the city. He was jailed for his role in, in organizing and leading that protest. King's letter is an open letter, responding specifically to some white clergy who had published a, a call for unity in the local paper. King argued that this call for, for unity, for, for peace, was really just a means of silencing black protests. These white clergy were effectively telling black Americans to be quiet and be patient and wait for conditions to improve. And in the letter from Birmingham jail, King makes this, this very famous argument about our responsibilities to one another. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. According to King, this is not just a, a moral proposition, it's, it's almost a, a challenge, right? It's, it's a demand. When we, are, when we are faced with human suffering anywhere in the world, we are obligated to attend to it and to do something about it. And if we fail to do that, King says, injustice spreads like a cancer. I think there is a lot of truth in what King says. The fact is, our relationships to each other, even our relationships to each other across oceans and, and across continents, are not just imaginary at least not anymore. When I buy a piece of furniture in, in my part of the world, there's, there's a good chance it was manufactured in a completely different part of the world. The same is true of the, the clothes on my back. It's becoming increasingly clear to us that, that environmental policies in one country are, are going to affect outcomes in other countries. When I watch a movie or a, or a TV show, it, it might be made by my fellow citizens, but it might also be made by people in the UK or, or in Korea. The global village is, in some sense, a real thing, and we are bound to one another. We, we do have ethical obligations to each other. Nevertheless, if we think back to Aristotle, it is the case, it's just the case that humans have limitations. You only have so much time, you only, you only have so many resources, there's only so much of you to give. But that doesn't seem to give us a license to, to turn away from, from human tragedy. So how do we navigate this? It's, it's like Scylla and Charybdis, you've got to find the line between between turning away from human distress and not caring about anything and and caring about everything so much that you you become exhausted and, and numb to all the terrible things going here's on. here's a couple things I, I think we need to do i think we can do ethically that might also kind of fix our brains one thing i think that's important is to act locally to to attend 
to the world around you. This this might mean kind of getting off your phone sometimes and like trying to do something for the people in your life or, or the people who live near you. In part, I think this is about bringing things back to a human scale, right? Like reminding yourself about the, the reality of other people and attending to the needs of people, maybe even in your own family or your own friend group. I think this is important because you can often have real tangible impacts on, on the other people in your life, even if you have very limited resources, even if you have no money and no power, you can give someone attention. You can, you can show kindness to other people. I think this matters because I, I think being grounded in a particular place, in a particular community, in, in a family, among friends, I think that's the root, the reservoir of your, your empathy. It's the source of your, your capacity to sympathize with other people. And if you nourish that, you will be better able, I think, to, to address maybe bigger, maybe more complicated problems, to, to contribute to solutions to those problems in, in, in more distant places. The second thing I think is is to choose causes that you believe in if there is some cause that, that really matters to you and, and try to help out there. Don't run to every fire. Try to become educated and, and informed on, on those things and, and try to help where you think you can. Choose something you believe in and help with that. Give to that cause. You can't solve every problem in the world by yourself, but we can all do something to help make the world better. And then another thing, and this is maybe this is a third thing, I think maintaining a sense of openness, a willingness to educate yourself, because there, there will be new things that you need to know about that, that we ought to attend to. And there will be a crisis, there will be, there will be a disaster that, that demands your attention and that we may be morally obligated to do something about. And I know it can be difficult to be pummeled by, by terrible images and videos and bad news all the time. I made a video about that. You should look at that next. Click on the link. I'll see you there. I'll talk to you soon.